Welcome to the Sustainable Sands Exploitation webinar featuring Carbon Wave's approach to sustainable ingredient production using sargasm. My name's Jen and I'll be the event uh, moderator. Thank you so much for choosing me as a moderator. And before we get started, I had some questions for you guys in the audience. So firstly, we will be doing a Q&A, so put your questions there. But as we're getting started, let us know where you're from. And I also had some additional questions that I was interested in. What are some of your challenges that you've experienced with natural emulsifiers? And also, what are some of your perceptions about seaweed in cosmetics? To introduce Covalo, Covalo is the data platform for the consumer goods industry. Covalo's mission is to make the consumer goods industry more transparent and sustainable by helping brands better connect, collaborate, and transact with the right ingredient, packaging, and service suppliers. Carbon Wave is also obviously featured in this webinar. They are the first company to successfully upcycle sargassum seaweed into a range of regenerative biomaterials. As a public benefit company, they strive to protect marine ecosystems, reduce methane emissions, and support local workforce development and in investment in the Caribbean and Mexican communities most affected by the growing sargassum issue. And with me, in this webinar today is Jeff Ye, Dr. Ben Yellen, and Valerie George. And I will direct my first question to Jeff, who I'll just quickly introduce. Jeff is the Vice President of Personal Care at Carbon Wave. He has two decades of experience in international business development and advanced manufacturing. He is also on the board of Schneider Filtration, an independent member membrane filtration company. Jeff has a passion for commercializing seaweed-based biomaterials to protect our oceans and communities affected by climate crisis. And so with that, my first question to you is, what is the problem with sargasm seaweed and how is Carbon Wave solving this problem? Well, thank you so much for having us on this webinar, Jen. Really excited to get into this uh, growing issue. Um, First, we have to talk about what is sargassum. So sargassum is a macroalgae. It is um, like any other seaweed, it's a macroalgae. So it does serve an important role in the marine ecosystem. What's unique about this um, type of seaweed is that unlike other seaweed, which are a natural carbon sink, sargassum actually floats. So it stays on the surface of the water, which means it's not stationary. It moves with the currents. And it's always been there. Um, there are many species around the world. We deal with two specific type, two specific species in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. And there was what was called the Sargasso Sea, which is off of the east coast of North America. Um, and this is a, a big origin area for sargassum. But what's happened in the last roughly 10 to 15 years is the sargassum has started to spread out. And now there is a new sargasso sea called the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt, which actually stretches from West Africa all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. So the sargassum is just growing at an alarming rate. And uh, the reason for that is because of all of the excessive nutrient runoff and the warming of the oceans. It's just more, more nutrients, a warmer environment, and this sargassum is just exploding. Uh, so it's been in the news a lot lately, and, and this is really the problem that we're trying to solve for. It's never been successfully commercialized, at least these two types of species, sargassum fluitans and natans, and that's what we focus on uh, with our collection efforts in Mexico and our patented gentle extraction process, um, in which we do in Puerto Rico. Um, so these are the two areas where we're making a lot of investment to try to upcycle. Um, we're collecting the sargassum as it lands on the beach. We're researching um, collection methods in the ocean um, before it reaches the beach to help protect um, the, the near beach ecosystems and economies as well. Um, so yeah, this is, this is kind of our solution. Uh, we, we've created what's called a cascading biorefinery to deal with the many different types of components that are within sargassum and how we can process them and turn them into useful upcycled advanced regenerative biomaterials so we're we are trying to solve for this problem and in the process 
finding as many different solutions to the to the problem that we can that could potentially be commercialized um, to allow us to collect more and more and more sargassum and get it off the beach. And just for those that are just entering this chat, I see lots of people from the EU and the United States. Thank you so much for letting us know where you are. We also want your feedback. What are some of the challenges you've experienced with natural emulsifiers? And also, what are some of your perceptions for seaweed? Okay, then my next question to Jeff is, what's the opportunity to support these ecosystems and the local communities? And then also a two-pronged question, what is the socioeconomic impact of sargasm? So the opportunity is tremendous. You know, tourism is the number one economic driver in these communities uh, by far. And uh, there's also a lot of, you know, fishing that uh, a fishing industry that that provides a lot of income to local folks in in these areas and both have been really really negatively affected by sargassum so you can imagine if you're spending your hard-earned money in the united states we take one maybe two weeks of vacation a year um, i think the europeans do it uh, much more intelligently than we do but if we're spending you know our hard-earned vacation money for a week are we going to go to Hawaii? Are we going to go to another beach? Or are we going to go to Florida, where they're also now getting sargassum? Or are we going to go to, you know, the Virgin Islands or the Caribbean or Dominica or some of these other beautiful Caribbean island nations um, or Puerto Rico, where we have our facility located? They're just getting inundated with the sargassum. And when it rots, it emits methane, it emits hydrogen sulfide, um, ammonia comes out of it. Uh, there's all kinds of nasty public health concern with sargassum. So it's not just that it smells bad. People actually get nauseous from it. So this is not an ideal place for someone to spend their you know, vacation. And um, as a result of sargassum, you know, to, there has been a 35 percent decline in tourism in the Korean in the Caribbean. And this is pre COVID. So you can imagine the effect that the double whammy of COVID and sargassum has had on these local communities. Uh, many of them have just been devastated. And so we are, number one, trying to collect sargassum so we can provide some um, relief to uh, these, you know, beach uh, hotel resort operators and all the associated mom and pop businesses, the small businesses in the community that then, you know, benefit from those tourism um, activity in those areas. Um, but we, we are also, you know, really trying to clean up the beach, not only for, for that purpose, um, but also to diversify the workforce, to teach them about advanced manufacturing of biomaterials, to provide some other pathways away from just tourism. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of different benefits that we can provide um, in those areas. And, you know, we're actually, uh, our just received news <clears throat> yesterday, that we've been officially approved by the gold standard. Uh, so this is a really big deal for the company, and we are tracking for four main SDGs as a result of that um, methodology that has been approved. So one is uh, climate action, SDG number 13. So we are um, investigating how sargassum um, acts as a carbon sink and um, how much we can work to prevent greenhouse gas emissions by collecting sargassum and pre preventing it from going to landfill where landfills are 16% um, of all the methane emissions in the in the world come from landfills and in these areas they spent 120 million dollars in 2018 just to collect the sargassum and dump it in the landfill so if we can avoid some of that we're going to have a huge impact on climate change um, SDG number 14, life below water, collecting, collecting the coral reefs, um, uh, protecting the eelgrass and the sea turtle colonies. Um, you know, a lot of UV light gets trapped uh, or gets blocked by these huge thick mats, two, three meters thick from reaching the, the seabed, uh, reaching the coral reefs and um, also affecting the eelgrass, which is very important in, in, in sequestering carbon. Um, and sea turtles, they can't reach the beach. They can't lay their eggs. They end up just putting the eggs on the on the sargassum or somewhere else, and they just take off because it's too much energy for them um, to try to make it to the beach. So, um, yeah. The, and there's a couple of other other uh, SDGs that we're tracking for: responsible consumption and production, trying to make products that can be an alternative to traditional fossil fuel derived ingredients, 
as well as providing you know decent work and economic growth uh, SDG number eight, which we already talked about, and really investing a lot of our effort in these communities. So, sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. Hope that answered your question. <laughs> no, that was that was a very <laughs> thorough answer. And just before I switch over to Ben for my next questions, just to finish off questioning you here on this topic, I was wondering. How does the use of sargasm fit in with a holistic view of sustainability? And also, what is the importance of having that holistic view as we're approaching sustainable development? So sargassum is quite an amazing material. Um, we talked about all the different SDGs and how this can really impact, um, you know, products that are using sargassum as an ingredient. You know, we're going to be helping to um, uh, to take out greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Um, it's an upcycled product. You know, the fact that we use no land, no fertilizer, no fresh water. We generate no wastewater. Uh, well, a minimal amount in our in the processing, but virtually, you know, 95 plus percent of the sargassum that we collect, we use in some way, shape or form. And we make other products from it as well. We make biostimulant. We're making um, a, a vegan leather, which is really amazing. That's in development right now. We've got a, 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 an incredible team that's leading this effort in Puerto Rico. Um, so there are just so many, you know, sustainability benefits. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about this. I'll let Valerie um, lead the discussion on the actual formulation. But it is, you know, it does work in a cold process. So we don't even need that much. Um, energy compared to other hot process emulsifiers, for example, um, in the processing. So there, there are some sustainability benefits in, in actually um, processing with with seed balance as well. So it kind of seems like a net positive there, which is really exciting for sustainable ingredients within a, a formulator's toolkit. Okay, so now I'm going to shift my questions to Ben. Ben Yellen has been working on the sourgasm issue for over three years since the founding of Carbon Wave. As an environmental scientist and molecular biologist, he is happy to give a background information and answer questions on sargasm and how it appears in the first place through our collection and extraction processes. Okay, so my first question to you, Ben, is how did sargasm become such a big issue? Um, thanks for having me. Um, the, the, you know, Jeff answered so much of this already, so it'll sound a bit repetitive, but, um, you know, sargasm was endemic to the Sargasso Sea. So when Columbus sailed across, he found this blob of golden colored seaweed with this, these uh, grapes on it. So Sargasso is Greek for grapes, and this, this is how it got named. Um, like Jeff said, warm waters, extra nutrient runoff from the, the uh, Amazon, certain upwelling currents uh, in Africa. And, and we have now, uh, you know, because it is not tied to the ground, it's not a benthic organism, it's, it's floats, it's pelagic. So it's not limited with space. So it's limited by nutrients. Obviously there's plenty of sun. Um, so with, with these extra nutrients in the Caribbean, it's, 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 it's blown out of control. I mean, there's megatons of this, uh, this stuff. You can see it from the satellite um you 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 can often i if you're trained you can see it all the time from airplanes uh flying over the area it happens in these yellow belts that you can see very clearly all the way from the sky um and it's not such a problem when it's out on the ocean um that can actually provide um uh well it's taking up some of the excess nutrients it's it's providing a habitat for fish eggs um the problem is generally when it masses onto the beach and land. So that's where we've stepped in with our technology to try and stop that from happening and to, to be collecting it and to be finding valorization for it. Um, you know, that's how it became a problem. It, it, 2011 was the first really noticeable year. So that was 12 years ago. And you've kind of alluded to this, but I'll ask the question anyways. Why is sargasm so good at taking advantage of all of these factors to grow into a bloom? You know, um, algae, macroalgae in general are very in tune to uh, taking nutrients from 
very from nutrient poor water let alone nutrient rich water so so they the seaweed are very good at doing this um you know it's 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 also one of our troubles um they're they're good at taking in uh the bad stuff the arsenic heavy metal so our processing has um is heavy on on cleaning the these these elements out um i'd say uh the, that's one of the differences that we have between, you know, say kelp or something is that we have to go through some extra steps to get to the same type of product. And then how does sargasm compare to other seaweeds? Um, well, sargasm is a brown seaweed like ascophyllum. So like kelp, um, if, if there are main categories of seaweed, there's red, green and brown. Um, red is, um, we extract carrageenan, agar from red seaweeds. Um, they are popular for bro bromophenols. Um, greens, you get your ulvans, um, chlorophylls, carotenoids. Browns, we have alginate, uh, fucoidins, some laminarin. Um, all of these seaweeds have Proteins, carbohydrates, polysaccharides, lipids, amino acids, vitamins, minerals. So they all have quite a lot in common. And then some of their more uh, secondary metabolites start to really get different. Um, we're most similar to ascophyllum, which in, in my research for what is used in cosmetics seems to be the most commonly farmed uh, seaweed kelp. Uh, to use for these type of extractions. So like kelp, sargasm is a brown seaweed. Unlike kelp, it, it is not confined uh, to, to, to roots on the ocean floor. It, it floats around. Um, so it generally has um, more of a chance to proliferate and grow um, and more of a chance to pick everything up along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, it's so, so the, whereas kelp is can be farmed and then harvested carefully. You know, sargasm is is more like a ranching type of uh, idea and, and collect it, collection of something that's happening naturally. With an obvious sustainable, sustainability benefit from its harvesting, would that be a correct assertion? Yes, like Jeff said, you know, it, it's, it wrecks havoc on local ecology as it comes into shore. It, it blocks the sun. It can really decimate sea, seagrass beds. Um, coral reefs are already under threat. This absolutely does not help. Um, it, it starts to come in and rot and degrade and create these anoxic zones near shore. You get fish kills. Um, when it does pile up onto shore, and I, I, maybe some of you have seen this, maybe some of you haven't. I mean, it's really quite disgusting. The smell is overwhelming. It's like um, like there's an open sewer in front of you or something right on the beach. I mean, these are pristine, amazing beaches, completely use, uh, unuseful for tourism or anything like that. So, you know, to, for us to be uh, collecting it from the beaches and removing it um, or preventing it from being there in the first place is uh, huge for them and, and very big for the ecology as well. It has to be done correctly. There are some real caveats in, and where and how you collect it. Um, there's care to be had on the beach. You, can, you can't just run a tractor on the beach and decimate the sand and the sea turtle nests either. So it's, it's, it's delicate thought uh, has gone into how to collect and, 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 and harvest this safely. And now my last question to you, Ben, before I switch gears to start talking about foriolation, you have alluded to this, but just in case there's something you want to expand, what happens as it breaks down and what's the danger to people and ecosystems? Again, you know, like Jeff said, I, you know, that there's the direct dangers to ecosystems. So problems with, with sea turtles, problems with the seagrass, problems, um, and then there's the the, the bigger uh, climate issues of that releasing that much methane. So methane is is a gas that's much stronger than CO2 at, at trapping heat, um, and th this uh, because it degrades anaerobically if it sits in a pile naturally. Uh, methane is one of the main things that's emitted as it degrades, um, along with 
H2S sulfide, which is what gives us that really nasty smell. Um, and uh, the methane is a potent greenhouse gas. That's that's part of the biggest uh, part of the gold standard carbon credits that we put together um, is for uh, preventing methane release. You know, from if we can use it, if we can use the sargasm in a product, obviously it didn't end up in a landfill. So we are able to say that we prevented that methane from entering the, in the environment. Okay, so now to switch gears to start talking about formulation, before I do a quick reminder to those in the chat, send me your questions and then I can ask that towards the Q&A, which will be after this section. And I will be directing these questions to both Jeff and Valerie. So Valerie, she is an award-winning chemist, industry leader, and glo globally recognized formulation expert. Valerie George has a passion for innovation and quality ingredients. A frequent speaker, author, industry mentor, and educator, Valerie is an active contributor in the Society of Cosmetic Chemists and was awarded the esteemed Chapter Merit Award in 2017 for her volunteer work and outstanding participation. She serves on the board of directors at Kent State University, where she is also a guest lecturer. Okay, so my first question here is, why do you think that sargasm is right for some of the current industry trends? Well, if you went to In Cosmetics Global, uh, you couldn't have walked down a single aisle without seeing the word upcycled or sustainably harvested or something like that. So I think in terms of what brands are looking for, in terms of what formulating formulators are requiring, this product absolutely hits the mark in terms of how the ingredient is uh, procured from a feedstock perspective and then produced. I think, um, you know, gone are the days where a raw material could just be produced from anywhere. People really are interested in the stories and they really are interested in how it impacts the environment and how it impacts communities. And I think Jeff and Ben have done a really great job at illustrating why sargassum can be an issue and how it also can be a solution in cosmetics and for communities. And then my next question, are there any advantages? Obviously there are, and we've been discussing them throughout the webinar, but perhaps there are more that you'd like to share. So any advantages for sustainability with sea balance in formulation? Well, I think there's a lot of formulation benefits, but I think Jeff can better speak to how um, sustainability actually plays a role in the raw material development. Sure, absolutely. Um, so the process in which we extract is very, very gentle. Um, there's no heat imparted in the process. And so this is really the key to our technology, um, to, it's our patented extraction process. This is the first time that anyone has ever attempted to um, extract this type of sargassum uh, for this purpose. It's the first seaweed-based e emulsifier for cosmetics and personal care of any kind in the world. Um, so the, the way in which we extract is highly sustainable. Uh, the fact that we use almost every portion of the sargassum with very, very little waste um, is a testament to the vision of the founders of the company and how they set up um, the cascading biorefinery to take advantage of all of the different components that are present. You know, my background in, in polymeric membrane filtration, I have a keen interest on isolating fractionating and concentrating different components to increase the value um, of that basic feedstock, like what we do in the dairy industry. Uh, we take milk and turn it into thousands of different products like whey protein, isolate, whey protein, concentrate. You know, maybe someday we'll have a, you know, sargassum protein concentrate or, um, you know, a fucoidin, you know, extract that we can concentrate on. Right now, what we're doing is, is really focusing on the biopolymer. And that's how we create our emulsifier. We're also combining it with a couple of other ingredients like xanthan gum for stabilizing and pentylene glycol um, for preservative. So it is a, like a wet paste product. Um, and it's kind of interesting to work with. Valerie will speak more on this. Yeah. <laughs> as, 
for sure. She's got some the most experience of anyone in the world, probably, of, of doing different types of formulations with seed balance up to now. Um, but you can use it in a cold process as well, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so we can save some energy in the in the processing. And uh, we haven't done a full like biodegradability study yet. That's on my like Q2 OKR to investigate. Um, but we believe that, you know, this material is coming from the ocean. Um, it is natural. And, um, you know, we just received actually our ISO 16128 score, which was a, a 99.5. <laughs> so we, we do think that, you know, if this product ever makes its way back to the ocean, it should not cause any issue. It should just go back to, you know, whatever state it would have been, hopefully at the bottom of the ocean, um, where it can tr keep everything trapped. Um, but it's something that we still have yet to study, uh, but we have high hopes for the biodegradability as well. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a little sense of how sustainable um, this, this product can be. And then again, around the formulation standpoint, what are some of the abilities of the C balance within formulation and compared to other emulsifiers, what are some of the advantages? Valerie, maybe do you want to chime yeah. in here? Yeah, so I've um, really enjoyed uh, using sea balance because it is cold processed, but it can also be hot processed. Sometimes you run into uh, cold processed emulsifiers that create these really beautiful uh, fluid emulsions where I think sea balance 2000 is really strong and you uh, can't use them hot or they have limitations with other co-emulsifiers. What I like about sea balance is it's really flexible. So you can... Um, pull it out of the jar. Um, as Jeff mentioned, it is, uh, I don't think paste is the right word, but it's kind of like a moist um, mass, um, which is actually really fun um, to work with. Uh, very easy to weigh out. You just throw it in hot, you throw it in cold, you throw it in um, with other emulsifiers. Like I said, it has really um, incredible flexibility. I think um, the flexibility in processing also allows it to create different types of products. You can create, I think, some of the most beautiful fluid or sprayable emulsions um, using it. I think you can create really beautiful um, thickened creams with lots of butters um, to demonstrate different textures as well. Um, I've also found that it offers some different yield or suspension characteristics. So if you have something you want to keep um, stabilized and suspended, uh, Sea Balance is pretty good at getting you um, on the road for doing that. And it has synergies with lots of other ingredients. So I think overall, um, you know, it's a pretty great uh, natural emulsifier to work with. And now I'm wondering, compared to other popular, especially natural emulsifiers, mm. maybe natural emulsifiers, maybe just compared to other emulsifiers, yeah. how does this emulsifier work? Well, this emulsifier is very process dependent, like a lot of other emulsifiers are, especially in the naturalist natural-ish space, especially I would say it's most comparable to the polyglycerol type emulsifiers, which have lots of uh, formulating requirements with them. Sea balance does require some high shear, which is not uncommon in the natural emulsifier space. So you will uh, need to break up the sea balance um, into your water phase first uh, with high shear and then when you add your oils, you also need high shear with it uh, to help distribute the oil droplets and break down your particle size. So I would say it's comparable in that sense, but something really important um, to note that this isn't an emulsifier that's going to make itself. Some emulsifiers, you know, you can dump them in your beaker or dump them in your production tank and walk away and come back and you have a really beautiful cream, this does require some attention to detail in terms of processing. So you just have to pay attention to that. I think from a skin feel and appearance perspective, um, it's also very comparable to the polyglycerol uh, type emulsifiers that um, can be used. So in that sense, um, I think it's on par. It has synergies as a co-emulsifier and stabilizer as well with other um, emulsifiers. So if it's um, not giving you exactly what you need, or you have to use a co-emulsifier to modify a texture, C-Balance will work with those other emulsifiers. 
And now you you brought up skin feel, and maybe we can expand on this a little bit. Has there been a sensory panel, and what have the results been? Yeah, so we did a lot of testing at the very beginning because I think when you um, are using a new ingredient for the first time, first and foremost, I you know, it needs to work. But secondly, I think we need to understand what consumers like about it so that you can understand how to better formulate with it. So I created many different formulations um, and compared them to different emulsifiers in the industry because I'm most familiar with other emulsifiers in the industry. And we have this new guy uh, coming to play on the team. So we wanted to know how it uh, stacked up to everything else. And we um, conducted a panel of um, of the products, uh, with a panel, I should say, and we um, looked at how it spread on the skin, how the product dried down on the skin in the different applications, uh, included cleansing formulations, lotions, creams, serums, and really we just wanted to know um, from a spreadability, a tackiness, a humectancy, a skin softness, um, how How did it compare? And it was uh, done with trained evaluators who have experience um, touching, feeling, um, and using these different emulsifiers. And uh, I would have to say um, Sea Balance fared really well. It uh, leaves a very soft, silky skin feel. It's not heavy. It's not super tacky um, in the dry down or sticky. It doesn't leave a weird film on the skin. And so from a skincare perspective, I would say um, it's pretty elegant and uh, adds very nice um, feel characteristics to formulations. And now with some natural emulsifiers, I know a lot of people, you can formulate around this, but a challenge can be a soaping effect upon rubbing. Is this a challenge with C balance? And how can that be overcome if it is? Yeah, that's actually a great point. That was another thing we checked for. Um, And actually, we kind of even stopped noting the scores because there's absolutely no soapiness uh, with C-Balance because it's not relying on uh, fatty molecules to create this emulsifier effect. And so therefore, you don't get that soapiness where you have to overcompensate by adding different silicones and uh, foam suppressors um, in lotions. You can just use it uh, with your oils and go. You can create really, really simple uh, formulations without any of that whitening or soaping effect, which is pretty great. Now I see some questions coming in in the chat, so keep them coming. I'm going to ask your question shortly. Now, Valerie, you have talked a lot about there's a lot of compatibilities Are there any incompatibilities? And also with respect to pH, is there anything that people should know with respect to the pH range that the emulsifier is stable in? Yeah, so uh, it works in a lot of situations. I think there's situations where it works best. So using um, oils that have some polarity to them, plant oils works really great. It is a, li- needs a little help when you're working with nonpolar emollients to emulsify them. And this isn't uncommon um, to any ingredient, right? Um, so I'd say its strength is with more polar materials and with nonpolar materials, it may need a co-emulsifier uh, with it. Because the xanthan gum um, is anionic, it is incompatible with cationic materials. So um, anywhere you're using xanthan gum, and you have incompatibilities, a C balance is the exact same because of that xanthan gum component to it. So cationics are out, uh, if it has a positive charge, uh, you may experience um, some challenges incorporating that in. Uh, but otherwise, from a compatibility perspective, uh, it worked really great in a lot of situations. Now that's not to say you can replace an emulsifier one-to-one with C balance and not have to change anything. It is very unique in feel um, and other characteristics in terms of emulsification properties. So you may have to do uh, some formulation tweaking to uh, offset it one to one. But that's that's with any formula. In terms of the pH range, I think it works really well um, in a pH of four um, to just less than eight, uh, where most personal care products fall, I probably wouldn't recommend it in high pH situations because um, it can emit a bit of um, an odor 
which is, uh, you know, if you like the smell of seaweed, that's great. Um, you, you can get it up there, but I probably personally just wouldn't recommend it. And there, unless you're working in um, hair color or depilatories, there's probably no real reason to be up in that pH range anyway. And then finally, are there any stability issues that you've come across as you were experimenting with sea balance? And if there were, do you have any tips and tricks for formulators to overcome these issues? Yeah. So stability is very important, obviously, to formulators and brands. And I was actually really impressed with the heat stability uh, that sea balance has uh, in its uh, ability to remain um incorporated to uh, not thin down. Um, I actually forgot some uh, stability samples in my 50 degrees Celsius oven and took them out a few months later. And I was like, wow, these look pretty good. Um, so heat stability, I would have to say is pretty amazing. One stability that chemists often forget about is a freeze thaw uh, stability, which I think is really important. And it does need a little assistance in freeze thaw. But once you uh, keep that in mind in your formulation work. Um, it's totally fine. Okay. So now I'm going to go on to some of the questions that we had coming in from the chat. This one is from Ruby. I thought this was really interesting. What happens when I wash sea balance off my skin? How do the emissions of it breaking down in wastewater differ from leaving the sargasm on the beach? What do you think? Ben, you want to try to take that one? I mean, Jeff's alluded to this a little that, you know, we, it, this raw sargasm that we're taking is made into a lot of different products and processed in a lot of different ways before the emuls before getting to the emulsifier. So the emulsifier is actually very clean uh, of anything that would be detrimental to the environment. Um, part, part, part of the evidence for that is that it, it can be allowed on skin. You know, all these levels are controlled and low enough. Um, so this is a simple mix of biological components breaking down some polysaccharides, some proteins. Um, it, it shouldn't cause any harm at all unless you know, you were enough of it to create some big anoxic zone because things were eating it because you could. So, I mean, you know, it's it's no problem at all for the emissions of it breaking down into wastewater. And I just wanted to add to that, the reason why sargassum emits so much methane is when it, it doesn't emit methane in the, in the ocean so much, but it, it, when it starts to rot, that's when the methane uh, comes out of the the, bio, the feedstock. It's because these microbes are consuming the rotting sargassum and they're the ones that are emitting the methane. It's not the sargassum itself, it's the feedstock for methane. So if you leave it on the beach, which is what would happen if we you know, weren't collecting it, you're, you're getting a lot of methane, you're getting a lot of like nasty stuff coming out of it. When we process it and preserve it, we are preventing that um, that process from happening. So that's a big part of why we want to get as much of it off the beach fresh before it starts to rot, uh, which is a really important part of our like quality control process as well. Um, then we can we can, you know, have an effect on on that specifically. And to keep in mind that yes, on a beach it would be uh, degrading anaerobically emitting methane in a wastewater treatment plant. That's actually controlled quite 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 well so you know you wouldn't be releasing methane um if anything you'd be releasing some co2 or something which would be much much less of an issue so um there's a definite difference in say the emissions from from valorizing and using this in a product and, and taking it from the beach preventing those uh landfill piles and then using it in a system like this This next question comes from Cindy, and the question is, I have a question regarding the price point for the product using this upcycled ingredient. Can you really use this ingredient for premium skincare and charge customers a high price? What do you think? So I will tell you that we have distributors now set up in many regions around the world, Europe, Korea, Southeast Asia, um, 
India, many, uh, many different regions around the world. And so far, you know, we are on the more premium end of price spectrum versus other premium natural emulsifiers. And the price has not been an issue uh, in terms of preventing the commercialization. I think focusing on the on the premium end of products is 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 really a good starting place. Or if you have a niche application where you're trying to use more upcycled or marine ingredients or both, we can answer both of those. Um, that's a that's a really great place to start. Hasn't prevented us from proceeding. Uh, we're starting to get regular orders now that we're fulfilling out of the pilot plant. Uh, we have just shipped the first whole pallet, 540 kilograms, to Italy. Um, so that's an actual order that people paid money for, which is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it is starting to, to to get commercialized, starting to take off a bit more. Uh, we're sort of starting to get inquiries like every day now. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. Um, one thing we didn't talk about is use level and really mm -hmm. this uh, has a typical emulsifier type use level um, i think the sweet spot's around four percent for it you can use it um, as a co-emulsifier down towards two percent um, i have used it as high as six but i think that's probably an extreme scenario so from an affordability perspective in your formulation it's very on par with other emulsifiers um, and ounce for ounce based on its use level. I actually took Cindy's question a little bit differently, um, not about it being expensive, but can you take an ingredient that basically is, you know, seawater trash and process it and then try to use it in a premium skincare brand? I think absolutely. I think there's a lot of um, demand for upcycling, including in the premium skincare segment. I um, mean, it all depends on how it's positioned. If you talk about the emulsifier being, you know, the ocean's garbage, um, you know, garbage seaweed, of, of course, a premium skincare customer, depending on the product positioning, may say, ooh, you know, what's that? Uh, but if you position it uh, much very differently as this uh, sustainable ingredient that's improving the environment, um, you know, it's all about the marketing, right? So um, working with the marketing team to speak about it. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, other unglamorous, not great um, ingredients that are in premium skincare that are, I would say, kind of bottom of the barrel um, emulsifiers and other actives or non-actives and um, customers are paying a high price. So I actually understood the question a little conversely, but. That's why I'm glad you're here, Valerie. <laughs> Okay, and then the next question, I thought this was also really interesting, is from Juliet. What about quantity capacity? Does the production depend only on available seaweed on the beach? Great question. Um, so last year, it was a record year for Sargassum. So 30, around 30 million tons of total of feedstock in the Caribbean. And we don't collect all of that, but... Um, it was a record. And so far this year, we are on track to absolutely smash that record from last year. Of course, it comes in waves. It's not all consistent. We're not getting, you know, a, a fixed cubic meter number every single day. Um, but there, we don't see any, any near term change in the trends, which are driving the growth in this algae bloom every year. Um, so we don't have any concerns about you know, the security of our supply for the for the raw material. Um, and we have long term contracts in place to collect kilometers lengths of, of shoreline for these resorts um, and local municipalities. We're working with the local fishing organizations. Um, you know, it's a coalition of really different um, industries that all have an interest in, in trying to get the sargassum off the beach. Uh, so that does give us some security in the long-term supply as well. Um, the question on, so that I, I guess that answers the question on, on incoming sargassum. The other question is on capacity to process. Um, in that regard, you know, we have closed our series A and we have the runway and the investment um, to build our full scale facility. And that is, you know, now, um, well underway. Uh, this is this is well documented in in the public domain now, so we can speak about it. Um, but we are, we are on track. Um, currently, we're we're in a pilot 
plant so we can we can produce you know a pallet um, and ship that in our in our current um, scaled up version of what we were doing before um, and this is a good test for ensuring that when we get to the full scale um, all the equipment all the processing all the SOPs um, are in place you know everything's going to be GMP ISO standard I've, I've I've set up manufacturing facilities before. This is a really, really fun time for me to see the equipment come in and um, test everything out. Um, so that's really what the big focus is going to be for us through the rest of the year. And by next year, uh, we should be you know, produ producing at like hundreds of tons per year uh, type of scale. Um, that's the plan anyway. So we'll see how well we do. Now we still have a little bit of time for questions in the chat before we close, but we also had some questions that came in previous to this webinar. So since I'm waiting for your questions, I will ask them or ask a few at least. So this next question I'll direct to Valerie. So this is along the lines of resistance to electrolytes. Can I introduce dyes in my formulation? And can I, for example, make a hair color conditioner? Eh, positive charges might be an issue, as Valerie uh, already said, using C balance. I think you're muted. Thanks. Yeah, there was some <laughs> feedback so I, I had muted. Um, I think in terms of a color depositing conditioner, the, the pH range is not an issue. Typically, your pH is anywhere from four to seven, uh, but the cationic dyes would be an issue. So if I were to formulate a color depositing conditioner, I probably would avoid the use of these basic dyes, which bear that cationic um, charge. And I would probably consider acid dyes. Uh, which at the appropriate pH range have a negative charge, uh, which may be more compatible with the C balance system for sure. Um, in terms of um, lowering pH, you can uh, lower pH even um, further than four. I haven't played around too much with that, but I think if you're around three and a half to four, you should be okay. Um, now, that being said, uh, the C balance is a little bit electrolyte tolerant. So that's not the issue. The issue is the cationic dyes complexing um, in the formulation when they should be complexing on the hair. Um, and I found this other question really interesting, but I wonder maybe it's already been answered, but I will ask it anyways. Is there any problems of supply due to the fact that this is naturally so sourced, um, Jeff or Ben? You know, I think Jeff talked about the, the the supply issue. I mean, this is this this is a bloom that's been happening year after year, increasing for the last decade. Um, so, I don't think there's any chance of the problem <laughs> going away, which would be. Um, but uh, you know. In terms of the supply coming in, we have we've I, I don't you can't talk too much about our process, but we we can store enough to supply the emulsifier process uh, very easily. Um, so you know don't, this is part of a biorefinery. So we're creating a biostimulant um, that's being sold for agricultural use uh, on the ground in Mexico um, and surrounding local places. Um, you know. The, the the raw material that goes into the emulsifier process is stable. So it can last a very long time. We can stockpile it, um, and we are. Um, and that's definitely not the issue. Um, Jeff Jeff would like would like to go faster on the production end and get more machinery so we can make more of it. Uh, the, the, the supply of the raw material is not an issue. Even the seasonality um, that's built into our processing, we figured that part out. And so another question from Cindy. What's next in the pipeline in terms of development or new products? Great. Uh, yeah, really good question. We we have some different versions of C balance that we're working on, which will allow it to hopefully answer some of the the voids, which Valerie has mentioned, where it might not be as strong. Um, so we're we're hoping to help flesh out the different types of formulations that um, are common 
in the field, um, which you know are not as compatible now um, with the current formulation of C balance. So this is next on our list. I can't really talk too much about it, <laughs> obviously, in terms of what our R&D and innovation pathway strategy, et cetera, is. But definitely, we have a lot of interest to um, keep working with this feedstock to come up with other useful ingredients for um, for formulators to test. Um, so something, you know, and I, something I have a real personal interest in, again, from my background in liquid liquid separation and, and focusing on specific, you know, separating things on a molecular level, um, something that's going to be very exciting to explore in the in the coming years, for sure. And I know you had already highlighted this a little bit previously, but this was a question that came in prior to the webinar. What is the natural index according to ISO 16128? Yeah, so we just got that um, test result and it is 0.995. Okay. And then another question that we got pre-webinar uh, for people in the chat, ask me your questions. We have a couple of more minutes. So ask me your questions and I'll ask them. Otherwise, you guys did send some of your questions previous to this webinar. So which is the inky for C balance? And then also, is it China approved? So the inky name is Sargassum fluitans natans extract. So these are the two species that grow together um, for all intents and purposes. We, you know, the performance is the same and it's actually physically impossible to separate them because they look identical. So we include both species in the PCPC inky name along with xanthan gum and pentylene glycol because remember it's a blended product. Um, the China question is more difficult. We've been working on this for a while and it is not officially China approved yet, but we have a couple of different pathways of how we can in how we can get the approval and the registration or notification with NMPA. So it's something that we're you know actively working on. Um, so yeah, you guys are asking a lot of great questions which relate directly to my OKRs for Q2. <laughs> <laughs> Another question along the lines, is C-Balance 2000 patented? Yes, so the, the extraction process is, is patented um, and the uh, process for, uh, well, it's, we've, we've filed the patent, so we're waiting for, for the approval, but it should be, you know, any, we should hear back and, you know, very soon. Uh, so yes, everything is, everything is patented. And now this question was specific to Italy, but maybe I will expand it. So the question was, do you have a local distributor for Italy? But I'll expand it to what's the global distribution of sea balance like for people who want to use this ingredient and also for maybe smaller scale formulators or indie brands that might not be able to uh, get to larger MOQs. Are there any smaller volume options for them? Well, maybe I'll let Valerie take the question on smaller volumes because we are kind of uh, working with her on that. And I'll speak to the rest of the world as soon as I pull out my the, the world map on my phone. Uh, go ahead, Valerie. Yeah, so I actually, um, in addition to running an R&D lab, Simply Formulas, where I formulate hair care and hair care hair color products for brands. I have a business called Simply Ingredients where I help uh, DIYers, home crafters uh, produce their own products through reselling uh, really cool ingredients to them. And so I've been very fortunate um, to partner with uh, Carbon Wave in being able to retail um, C Balance 2000 in the United States and Canada uh, on my website, and it'll be launching in the next week. I'm very excited about that. Simply uh, dash ingredients.com. Uh, and, but I think there's also some other options for anyone in Europe looking to uh, get their hands on small sizes of this for their um, hand, handmade brands. Right. So speaking of smaller sizes, so there's a, a group that we're working with in Portugal called Plena Natura um, that really does focus on this, on the smaller size, but I should, I should start with Italy because uh, this is our first distributor that we signed, Bergaglio. Uh, they've been an absolutely incredible group to work with, um, have helped us learn so much about the applications, limitations, ideal use case, 
um, where to position and target the product and what additional information we needed to provide to be, you know, truly um, a qualified supplier to the world at large. Um, so we work with Bergoglio in Italy and Greece, um, and we work with uh, Biesterfeld in the Dock region and Poland and the Baltics. I hope I get all these <laughs> countries right. And we work with Grohlman in uh, the Iberian Peninsula in Portugal and Spain. They're our main distributor there for you know, larger companies. Uh, and then we work with Aston Chemical in the UK. We work with Intercare in Korea. And we work with Chemico in Southeast Asia. And uh, we work with DK Specialty Ingredients in India. Uh, so these are the areas that we have set up so far, and we're working on other regions frantically uh, as we're uh, getting prepared to support all of the interest that we have received from, you know, Incos Global winning the Green Ingredient Award. Um, the bronze for Green Ingredient at Incos Global was really, really huge for our, um, you know, generating some more interest around testing the product. So we've, we've got to work quickly to make sure we've got local support in all the regions around the world. So that folks can get the samples and they need and the formulation advice that they need to um, to properly work with the product. And now this is probably going to be the last question that we have time for. This is from Crystal. Uh, so the question is: Are any formulation prototype samples available using Sea Balance, preferably a moisturizer? If not, is achieving a gel cream texture possible with Sea Balance? So in terms of prototype availability, I encourage you to reach out to Sea uh, Balance or maybe a, a Carbon Wave or a local distributor. I think Jeff can um, probably point you in the right direction there. There are prototype formulations available. I worked on a lot of them and I worked on a lot of moisturizer applications because I think Sea Balance does really well in that perspective. And it is possible to achieve a gel cream texture. Um, it just depends on what you're trying to incorporate in the formulation with it. I did forget, yeah, I'll just add one thing on speaking of moisturizing. I forgot to mention that we did get our um, official testing and were able to prove that we have a moisturizing, a significant moisturizing effect compared to some other, you know, all natural and synthetic benchmark emulsifiers. And we also were able to, you know, uh, maintain um, to, to prevent the transepidermal water loss um, up to six hours um, after application. Um, so definitely, you know, moisturizers, um, moisturizing, you know, type of applications is a, is a great area to explore as a formulator. And I lied. I actually have one more question. In this question, I will ask to Lisa from Covalo. So where can we find other players in industry doing similar brilliant upcycling work to help us develop an upcycled focused uh, portfolio? Hi, everyone. Uh, so you haven't seen my face yet, but I'm Lisa, Digital Marketing Manager at Covalo. Um, and for this question, um, I think Covalo might be your answer, actually. Exactly. So um, oh, yeah. you can explore within a base of only upcycled ingredients um, and directly get in touch with suppliers. I can give you a very quick uh, one minute example. So you can see my screen here. We can just start by showing you how you can find directly the ingredient we've been discussing today. So that's sea balance. And there we go. Um, the ingredient details instantly pop up here and you can directly make a request, by, for example, a quote, a sample, uh, send a message or a document request. And Jeff on the uh, webinar here will be on the other side to respond to you. Uh, <laughs> find any other ingredients that are also upcycled with uh, but with different functions or applications uh, then we do have some uh, claims here so for example the sustainability claims uh, the upcycled will show up here in the filter as well um, and for from here you can for example up um, sorry you can for example bookmark um, a few or even compare uh, ingredients to find the right ingredient for you so uh, that's how a quick uh, example of how to use Cavallo for these types of searches. So after all of this, if you're feeling inspired by this webinar and want to get your hands on this ingredient, create an account on Cavallo now to request a sample or quote 
for sea balance. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. Thank you for all of the questions. Massive thank you to uh, Covallo for choosing me as a moderator. Thank you to Jeff, Ben, and Valerie for their time. Stay tuned. There will be a replay, and you'll probably receive that in your email shortly. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and thank you again for tuning in.